When my daughter was, when she was four or five, she asked me a very similar question that you are said. She said, Daddy, am I living a dream or is this reality? <laughs> so then I asked her, I said, so you tell me. So she said, is it, is the world that I live in, is it my dream or is it, is it imagination or is it reality? So I asked her, you tell me. And she said, it's both. It's my imagination and it's reality, both. But this question persists, am I living a dream or is this reality? And I'm actually very afraid because it's such a subtle question. I'm afraid that as she grows, they'll take that question away from her in the way they educate her. So let's talk about childhood and education. And in the school, the Isha school, tell me, is that an issue, what you're trying to do here? Essentially, education is basically about enlarging the horizons of human perception. But unfortunately today, slowly education has shifted into a mode where people believe is about enforcing information, <laughs> heaps of information. Information is useful, is utility, you know, it's, it's useful in a certain way, but it's not going to make your life. It'll earn you a living. So right now, most of the education on the planet has become essentially a means to earn a living, not to enlarge your horizons. So here at Isha Home School, education is about enlarging your horizons. So this is not about giving them ready-made answers as information. This is to have an active intelligence which constantly searches and seeks and looks at everything in every possible way. Above all, to know the joy of wondering about life, not having ready-made <laughs> answers for everything. Ready-made answers are religion, mm. it's not life. And so the question everybody's going to ask you is, in this highly competitive world, are you saying that they'll come out non-competitive or they will have such awareness that they'll make them become even more... Uh, their ability to deal with this world will be more precise? <laughs> See, when you're competitive, Suppose uh, you and me are walking and you're in competition with me. You will either get to walk slightly faster than me mm -hmm. or probably less than me and feel depressed about it. If you walk little faster than me, you are going to be thinking you've reached the peak of your life. If you fall behind me, you'll feel depressed that you can't walk as fast as me. But if you're not in competition with myself, you would explore the possibilities of what you could do and maybe we don't know you could fly. I can walk fast, maybe you could fly, but you will miss out the possibility of flying because you're in competition with me. All you want to do is take few steps more than me. So the very human potential is distorted because people are in competition. Right now people believe that you will not propel yourself to your fullest if you're not in competition which is a very false idea, it's a very, very false idea. We have cultivated that in societies, that you believe you will not reach your full potential unless you're in competition, not at all true. Actually, only when a human being is in a very extended periods of joyfulness, blissfulness, he will stretch himself to the limits and do what he could do to the fullest. When he's in competition, when he's in fear of failure, he will only do little better than somebody else. So the human genius is completely missing today. You're destroying the human genius through the process of education, teaching competition. It's all about getting two marks more than your... the one who's sitting next to you. Yeah. And uh, in this mode of competition, only one can win, all others are losers. Yeah. Isn't it? It's a horrible way to create a society. What I'm saying is the gardener in this school is as important for us as the headmistress of the school. So that's what the children are constantly perceiving. We are not saying these things as philosophies, but that's the atmosphere that is set. The one who cleans the place, one who cooks for us, is as important as the teacher who teaches you science or literature or runs the school or me who visits once in a way to give them a different perspective of the whole thing. See, one of the school kids came to me, he was only twelve years of age, he's a brilliant boy. Yeah. He wrote me a four-page letter, his language, his articulation of his thoughts and the kind of things that he said in the letter just amazed me, I couldn't believe. 
a twelve-year-old child, his letter is like a document. I said, my God, this boy is here. I said, I want to meet him. So, it is a big thing for them to earn a appointment with me because generally I'm not available, my time is so scarce, I'm spread so thin. So I said, I want to meet the boy, so we gave him an appointment. So he came, sat in front of me. He said, Sadhguru, I want to know, I want to know the truth of life. I don't want to waste my life doing simple things like my... I don't want to waste my life, life like my parents. I said, stop, don't talk about that now. If parents wasted their life, that means your existence is a waste. Only because they did those stupid things that you think are stupid, you exist. So, let's get the things in proper perspective. Right now, there's a Dhyanalinga temple here. Tomorrow morning, without any explanation, if I just close it, if I don't open it at six o'clock in the morning, all the people, thousands of them will come, look and see, oh, temple is closed, why? Sadhguru closed it, oh, he must have some higher purpose. They will wait for one or two hours, oh, he's not opening, they'll go about their work. Every day they'll come, wait and go. Suppose I close the kitchen, without any explanation, if I close the kitchen, they'll come for lunch at ten o'clock in the morning and uh, they will see, oh, it's closed it. Oh, Sadhguru has closed the kitchen, no food today means something really spiritual is going to happen. He's going to give us something today. Maybe it's a great party in the evening. Evening you come, again it's closed. Tomorrow again it's closed. Next day, if it's again closed, you'll forget to be a spirituality, you'll start a revolution in the ashram. Yes? Right. Suppose without any explanation, I close, shut down all the toilets in the ashram. Within two hours, there'll be a revolution. So I asked him, tell me which is more important, temple or toilet? Aha, uh -huh, he said, that's it. Once you put one above the other, you are not going to know anything in this world. Your whole perspective is distorted. So that is the basis of competition, trying to put one above the other. Once you make one thing bigger than the other, one thing small, one thing big, one thing high, one thing low, one thing divine, another thing filthy, then you miss the whole point of existence. So the essence of education is to enhance your perception in such a way that you are able to perceive a blade of grass being as important as the coconut tree is not less important, it's different, that's all. So, everything that is a different... Uh, every difference that you find in the world, if you make it into a discriminatory process, that is what you're su suffering a prejudiced world. Every difference, whether between races or, or nations or languages and cultures and even gender, every difference we have made it a discriminatory process. And that has been our mode of education also, unfortunately. So, here at home school, there's... What the most important part of education here is not taught, it is a constant demonstration. All the teachers are dedicated people, they're all volunteers, hugely educated, but they're all here to volunteer their full time, their life they're volunteering to make this happen for the children. So the, the key element of the school is the way everybody moves, the way everybody sits and stands and eats and does everything. Education, you have to follow some system, we are following ICSE. But uh, the most important thing is the atmosphere, the ambience, the way it is. One thing you will see is the strength of the children. The mental strength of the child here is phenomenal. Today, that is one thing that's missing in the urban schools. They're all becoming flaky. Competition will make them determined and focused in one way, at the same time make them fearful of failure, fearful of, you know, being less than somebody else. Here you'll see they don't have that at all in them. Every one of them is a king by himself <laughs> I noticed that. I've seen the children, and uh, I've saw these children, but I've seen other children. And what surprises me mostly is that there's a certain sense of alertness in them. When I go back to urban areas, anywhere in the world, you see children walking to school, and there, there's, a, there's that sense of lack of purpose, I guess. <laughs> now, I can't say, I can't impose purpose on kids, but I have to say, whenever I've seen kids from the Isha school, wherever I've seen them, they're completely alert. They seem to be going from one place to another with a, with a sense of identity and sense of doing something. And I find that, and with, with a lot of happiness, it's not that they don't laugh, 
See, getting to know something for any human being, getting to know something, moving into a new area of life, learning is always a joyful process. But unfortunately, schooling is not a joyful process for most children. I must tell you this, yeah. when I was just in my sixth standard, the president of India died. And we got two days leave, the school was closed for two days. We went to the school, then the, we came to know he's dead and they announced that it's holiday today and also tomorrow. So all of us met, me and my friends, wow, the president died means we get two days. We didn't know this until then, two days off. Suppose the prime minister dies, how many days? Chief minister dies, how many days? In our minds, we're just killing the whole <laughs> cabinet <laughs> one by one. If they all die this year, how many days off will we get? Why is school such a horrible place? Because learning is always a joyful experience for any human being. Oh, it should be. It is actually, when you get to know something new, there is a certain invigoration of energy within you. But that's not happening in the school simply because of the way it is delivered. So, that's the reason I started this school and I wanted that to be different, that people must be excited about learning. You won't believe it. At uh, 11, 11.30 in the night, some children can't sleep. They say, Akka, Akka, please, Akka, open the library. I just want to see this one thing. You know, this is a regular thing. I just want to... Just Akka, I won't spend time. Five minutes, I want to just see. He wants to know before he goes to bed. He can't go to bed without knowing that now. Because it's always like that. So, to keep that enthusiasm up, to keep that inquisitiveness up, longing to know, that is the job of the teacher. Knowing is the child's job. Here the teacher is just working to keep that up, the longing to know. So, any special techniques you developed here and in sense of... I mean, I'm, I wish that I was taught mathematics differently and now, <laughs> you know, at this age I'm obsessed with mathematics. But I should have learned it that and all I can remember is the fear of maths. <laughs> uh, they're employing uh, nothing very special as such because what I see is, it is information versus inspiration. Here, they're inspired, that's why you see them moving about with such energy, they're inspired. Information, if you have an alert mind, you can gather any time. And today, the way the technology is developing, you carrying all the information in your head is not any more relevant, you know? Mm -hmm. It's all there on the net, if you have an alert mind when you want it, you have it. <laughs> They're doing very well academically also. And are you planning to, own, to open more schools? I thought because there's so much demand, we thought at some point we should uh, open four... maximum of four schools in India, this kind. One in the western... this is the southern one, mm -hmm. one in the western sector, northern sector and eastern sector. But uh, opening a school like this will not happen because you build buildings. You have to get those kind of people who are committed to making it happen. Uh, that's always a challenge because uh, dedication is a scarce material in the world today. Though we are enjoying that much in Isha, mm. still it's a very scarce material in the world. Everybody is always doing something, thinking, okay, what will I get? Not doing something simply because they love to do it. Those people are very small number. So, we're talking about childhood, <coughs> innocence, and its relevance to us as adults. I didn't talk about innocence, I don't think a child is innocent. Okay. Oh, he can be very mean. Okay, <laughs> if he doesn't get what he wants, he'll get very mean. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The beauty of the child is he's flexible. That's all that needs to happen to the adult also. Not that he's innocent, ignorant, this, that, that's not the point. The point is that he's flexible. That's the most important aspect of the child. The same thing comes to the adult, he's also fine. Generally, it's become fashionable for people to say, like a child, somewhere <laughs> they're thinking adulthood is evil, childhood is a good thing. No, child is just in the making. Adulthood is the, adulthood is the real thing. Even so-called spiritual people go about saying, I'm like a child. So I keep asking people, do you really want to be a child? Suppose, at the age of six, your body and your mind stopped growing and you remained a child, 
Mm. Is it a great thing? Yeah. We'll call you retard, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it good you've grown out of your childhood? Because you made a mess out of your adulthood, mm -hmm. you are aspiring for your childhood. <laughs> I think adulthood is great. <laughs> Do you think the children have that kind of perception that we then have to work towards? Do you think we need to uneducate ourselves? Do you think that the normal learning processes that we go through in modern day life is actually lessening our ability to become greater human beings or more no. perceptive? No, Shekhar, the thing is, what you know mm. is not the problem in your life. The more you know, the better it is, okay? Mm. That's why you're trying to know. But now you're complaining, knowing is a problem, I have to unlearn. No, I wouldn't say that. Knowing is not causing... What you know, knowledge is not causing problem. You're identified with what you know, that is what is causing problem. If you learn to be not identified with what you know, all that you know, whether it is considered great knowledge or it's considered filth on the street, both are useful actually to live a life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So knowledge is not the problem. You get identified with every bit of information that you gather, that is a problem. Identity is a problem, knowledge is not the problem. So be your... somewhere when you say, I want to be like a child, you're celebrating ignorance. And I'm singing Asutoma Sat Gomaya and you're saying <laughs> No, knowledge is not the problem, knowledge is not the burden, you... identity is the burden. You get identified with limited things that you know, that is a problem. So let's talk more about identity, let's explore the idea of identity. Then, who am I beyond my knowledge, my identity, all the things that we talk about, who am I? It's just... it's a question that everybody will ask you, Sadhguru, I know, <laughs> and it's a very large question. So let's start, start with identity. What do I identify with in myself that I say, this is me? And when you say, well, actually, this is just your accumulations. So then what do I... what... what do I identify with, if anything? See, to operate in the world, to function in the world, you need an identity. Now, if you can't go in Mumbai and somebody asks you, who are you, you can say, I can't... I'm a nobody. That would be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, to function with people around you, to function in the society in which you exist, you need an identity. The shaker will not do, because there may be too many shakers, you need a Kapoor attached to it. So, it's giving you an identity. If you say Shekhar Kapoor, even if I don't know anything about you, just listening to your name, one thing I know, oh, he's from India, mm -hmm. okay? You may not be identified as an Indian, but I know okay. you are obviously of Indian origin. Listening to Kapoor, I think, okay, he must be somewhere in this region of India. Mm -hmm. So, it... it gives certain excess ability to function with each other, so we have certain cultural identities. So in that sense, identity is perfectly fine. But if you believe I'm that, then you're in a mess. It limits you in a huge way. If you believe I am a Kapoor, then you are in trouble because your identity limits you. Because the very way the human mind works is, your mind works always around your identity. What you're identified with always seems to be right. What you're not identified with doesn't seem to be right. See, yesterday in the program that you went through, there was a man from Islamabad, he's Pakistani. And the guy did not tell anybody that he's from Pakistan because of a whole lot of situations going on, you know, whatever. In... yesterday night he came and told me I'm from Pakistan. I said, that's great, I truly appreciate that you came here. You should have told everybody. People would have reached out to you like anything in this country. But in his mind, he thought this identity could be a problem. So being an Indian and a Pakistani is essentially a political identity which just popped up fifty, sixty years ago, okay? Before that, there was no such thing. Suddenly we became this, where did this come from? We invented it, right? Somebody drew an artificial line and said, those who fall this side are Indians, those who fall that side are Pakistanis. And just see how much trouble, because you're identified with that. Now, having an identity for practical purposes of operation in the world is one thing, but having an identity to make yourself into something within yourself is a different thing. 
you're trying to build your essential nature with your identity, that's a big mess. That means you will not be a being, you will not be a human being, you will just be a thing, an idea, a thought, an opinion or a bundle of prejudices which go with that identity. Every identity is a prejudice. The moment you are identified as an Indian, everything Indian seems to be nice to you. Something else which is against the Indian is also against you. It's, it's not a thing that you have to think, it just works like that within you. And that would apply to, so I'm Shekhar Kapoor, that's my name, I'm a father, I'm a filmmaker. All of that is identity. Yes. So all of that... So, I understand, so how do you go beyond identity because that's what we've... Now known. you want to function in Bollywood, you have people, it's better people know that you're a filmmaker, otherwise nobody will ask you to make a film. Yeah. So there to work in the world, it's necessary. But if you believe I am, I am a filmmaker and that's what I am, I think it hugely cripples you because your mind will work only around that. The more, the deeper your experience of life, the better filmmaker you would be for sure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The better you'd... anything you would be for sure, isn't it? Now there is a school teacher teaching six-year-olds, but that person, how deep that person's experience of life is, that better a teacher he or she is, isn't it so? How deep my experience of life is, that better a guru I am, isn't it so? Mm -hmm. Isn't that true with filmmaking? Yeah. But the depth of your experience will be crippled the moment you identify yourself with something. You can deepen your experience only if you're wide open to everything, isn't it? I agree. So, who am I? I come <laughs> back, I keep back. I'm, I keep saying. Now you're asking me yeah. who you are. Yeah. This is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Who am I if I... Am? If you ask me who I am, yeah. it's different. If you ask... If you, are, if, you, if you go to anybody and say, who am I? That's... Uh, then they'll take you to psychiatric ward. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, I'll risk that. I'll risk that. <laughs> Who am I? So right now, the human condition is such that without knowing anything about the nature of his existence, he's trying to make a living. Without knowing anything about what this is, he's trying to somehow pass through the world. Obviously, it is going to be very accidental, isn't it? So when a person is going through his whole life in an accidental manner, he being in a great sense of anxiety, fear, struggle is very natural. And now we are going about describing life, life is struggle, life is not struggle. If you are blind, walking from here to there also is a struggle. If your eyes are open, joyfully you can walk through. So life has become a struggle because there is no clarity of perception as to what is me, what is the world, what is the nature of this existence, there is no perception. So if I tell you, you are a human being, it satisfies you, but if you think a little more, it doesn't work. If I tell you, you are Atman, you are a soul, it satisfies you. If you think a little more, even that doesn't work. So whatever I'm going to tell you is not going to work. So you, only if your perception takes you there, because only what you perceive you know. What somebody else tells you is only a story. It may be a true story, but still a story, isn't it? Stories will entertain you. Stories may inspire you. Stories may solace you, but stories will never be a solution in your life. Stories will never realize you, isn't it? So there's no alternative to working hard towards perception? No, again, working hard, why should you work hard to become yourself? <laughs> if you want to become something else, you have to work hard. To be yourself, why should you work hard? There's no working hard, anyway you're that. The enlightenment is not an achievement, it is just a realization. When we use... see, this must be very, very clear. This is a realization. We say self-realization, God-realization. When we say realization, it simply means you are only... you only perceived what is already there. You didn't invent something, you didn't create something, you didn't attain something. What was already there, you just realized. Yes? Mm -hmm. So it is a realization, it is not an attainment. Then why is it so difficult? <laughs> I mean, what you're saying is very simple, it's there, it's there, everything is, is, is creation. Why is so it why difficult? is it so difficult? It is not difficult, it is just that it's in a different direction. Right now, 
your whole perception of life is through the sense perception, yes? Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Sense organs in the very nature of things are outward bound because they are essentially created for your survival. You can see what is around you, you cannot roll your eyeballs inside and scan yourself. You can hear this, so much activity in the body, can you hear that? No. no. Even if something as small as an ant crawls upon this hand, you can feel it. So much blood flowing, can you feel it? No. So in the very nature of things, your perception is right now outward bound. But the basis of your experience is all inside of you. See, right now, you see me, you think, you believe you see me sitting here, but it's not true. Actually, in your experience, you are seeing me within yourself. Light is falling upon this, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina. The whole experience is inside, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You hear me within you, you see me within you, you see the whole world inside of yourself, the way it's projected. Everybody's a filmmaker, actually <laughs> okay. isn't it? Yeah. They're projecting the world inside, the way it's projected. The same world may not be projected the same way as it is being projected within you, within the experience of an insect which is sitting there. In the bird, it is different. In the dog, it's... you know, dogs don't see the color. Mm. If you wear all the colorful clothes and come, they just stare at you because you're all black and white. Today, there is substantial knowledge about this thing that neurologists are telling you, whatever you see is broken, the information is broken into fourteen different aspects mm -hmm. and you are actually seeing me in fourteen different parts of your brain, not in one place. If one part of it doesn't work, you may not see the color. In another part doesn't work, you may not, not see the texture. So, you understand this being a filmmaker, <laughs> isn't it? You can take a camera and do this to get the color right, to get the texture right, to get the form right, to get everything right. There is a certain thing involved. So all this is happening within you in many different ways. It is just not the way you're seeing it. It's in many different ways as it is necessary for your survival. What is day for you is night for somebody else, isn't it? Another creature thinks it's night. What is night for you is day for them. So even what is light and darkness is your making. So that's why in this culture, we went on saying, it's your karma, it's your karma. When we say it's your karma, karma means action. When we say it's your karma, we are saying your experience of your life is one hundred percent your doing. It's your doing, nobody else is doing. So right now, your sense organs are all outward bound, but the basis of your experience is within you. You have no way to access it. Who you are is within you, but your perception is all outward bound. So this is like someone came looking for Isha Yoga Center to a close by village. And they asked a local boy, how far is Isha Yoga Center? And he said, it's twenty-four thousand nine hundred and ninety-six miles. I said, what, that far away? He said, yes, the way you're going. Mm. If you turn around, it's only four miles <laughs> So right now it seems difficult because you are facing west, and wanting to watch the sunrise, it's a very difficult thing. If you turn around, it's a very simple thing. So this turning around, to look inward, the necessary basis has not been created in the society today. There was a time when spiritual process was the main thing in this society, in this culture. At that time, any number of realized beings. Realized being was not a rarit rarity in this culture. People had sages and saints just about anywhere, isn't it? because there was necessary infrastructure. At that time, in a village, there would be only one person who could read. I remember this when I had a farm in Karnataka. There's only one person who can read in the village. Everybody gets their personal letters for him to read, you know. A wife wants to read a letter that her husband has written. A postcard comes. She goes to this man and he has to read. So he reads and interprets, interprets it in a million ways that he knows. So, just literacy was a rare thing because the necessary infrastructure was not there. And it looked like one strange mystical thing that somebody is able to look at the postcard and say all these things, look like a great mystical thing. Right now, that's exactly what you're talking. Why is it so difficult? It's not difficult because we did not maintain that infrastructure of inward looking in the society. 
you did not cultivate that right from your childhood, now it looks like a far away thing. Suppose you did not know how to read and write, if you look at a book and somebody looks at a book and saying all these things, would look uh, like a mystical process, isn't it? <laughs> we haven't invested in yeah. that direction. So that's exactly what we're trying to build now, to build an infrastructure of spiritual process in the world, to give the necessary infrastructure, because no society has invested enough towards the inner well-being of a human being. We have hospitals, we have schools, we have toilets, we have this, we have that, but we don't have enough infrastructure for the actual well-being, the inner well-being of a human being, because your well-being and whatever else you go through, your joy and misery happens within you. Your pain and pleasure happens within you. Agony and ecstasy happens within you. Everything that happens to your human being happens within you. For that we have not built any infrastructure. So there was a time, there used to be... They say Krishna built about 1400 ashrams across the country, in the northern plains, because he felt that's an infrastructure that's needed for the society to live well. So we don't have such infrastructure. 